sure. I mean, uh, you guys all know The Simpsons, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Me too. I uh, I started drawing The Simpsons uh, about ten years ago uh, because I just wanted to draw Futurama. I love The Simpsons. I love Futurama. And uh, one day I just uh, told them that I wanted to do it so badly that I would do it for free. And meanwhile, they, they immediately said, well, we, we can't do that. We, you have to pay. You. So uh, they did. So anyway, uh, I feel weird about this because Phil is really, really good at this. And I'll try to like do what I do. Uh, but you know, The Simpsons, uh, and like most animation, um, when you draw the characters, they need to look a certain way. So what they do is they produce these style guides that basically all the characters are, are based on. And um, because I work on the comic books as well as Sergio, uh, I have to do my best to make the characters on my pages look like the show. And that's where this whole thing started. Uh, when I first started working on The Simpsons, they asked me to work on uh, the book called uh, The Treehouse of Horror. The Treehouse of Horror is their annual Halloween issue. And uh, the book uh, has basically gotten amazing artists to work on it. You know, people like Bernie Wrightson had done uh, some of it. Uh, Dan Burton had done some. Uh, just talented, talented artists. Uh, and too many to mention. I can't even mention them because, again, there's so many of them. Uh, and what they do is they draw them in their own style. So they still look like The Simpsons, but they're, you know, just a little tweaky and whatnot. They, they, they represent more what the artist does. Uh, but because uh, when I started drawing comic books, I was someone who emulated other people's work. I didn't have a problem drawing the characters on the model sheets. So when they finally allowed me to work on The Simpsons, they said, oh great, that'll be awesome. Here, Here's a script, go ahead and do it. And I'm like, okay, can you do me a favor and can you send me the model sheets? And they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. For Treehouse of Horror, you get to draw it the way you draw it. And I go, oh, that's cool. Give me the model sheets because I want to do it the way you guys do it. So basically, because I insisted on drawing the book in, on the model sheet, I've been able to draw it for like the last 10 years. And great, now Phil's here, he's got his glasses. I'm going to actually turn it over to him because he kills at this. And I'll draw too, but I'm going to let him go first. I kill him what? We're going to show them how to draw the Simpsons. And you're asking me? Yeah, because you're all awesome at that. Come on, you could do this. <laughs> now, I'll also a question for Phil, and then obviously Sergio, who also uh, did a lot of uh, work with Mad Magazine uh, that you did not know about. And talk a little bit about it going from big kind of a niche thing, you know, The Simpsons was on the Trace Goldman show before, you know, it got big. Mad Magazine was a niche product, and it got big as well. Did that surprise you? Know, you, you oh, you're talking to me? Phil answered, you know, yeah, about it basically, the, the product growing into such a big, you know, brand. Okay. The Simpsons and the both were obviously Mad Magazine. Because you were, you were there all from day one. Uh, for the half hour show, I was. Yeah. And, uh, Yes, yes, uh, but none of us had an inkling about how big it was going to be after we started on the first season, you know, because uh, a lot of people were thinking, yeah, to themselves, yeah, uh, we'll, probably, it'll probably last one, one season and then that's it, we can pay our bills for about a month, but there was one person on the show, uh, her name, she was our producer, her name was Margo Pipkin, and she had foresight. I think it was two or three days after I, I uh, started there. Um, she came up to me and she says, Phil, don't go anywhere. We're going places. This thing is going to be bigger than Taxi. It's going to be bigger than Cheers. That's because we had the exec producers of those shows on The Simpsons, James L. Brooks and Sam Simon. And I said to myself, you know, if you say so. But, uh, after the first season knocked off the most powerful show on TV, which was Bill Cosby, which was number one week after week after week after week, when I found out that The Simpsons beat Bill Cosby, this had to be the, the start of something big. So, uh, so I was just...
just there for the first two seasons, and then I got a call to Disney. Uh, I can't miss an opportunity with Disney, so. Yeah, tell them how you designed certain of the characters that everybody is so familiar with. Those are your creation. No, well, actually, it's not a creation. It's it's a it's a design. Uh, the uh, uh, script writers actually create the characters because they have descriptions on their personality, what they should more more or less look like, their uh, uh, their catchphrases, the whole thing, and we're supposed to relay that on on paper. Uh, with a design. So I, uh, how long do I have to talk about it? You, you have to draw one. Oh, okay. <laughs> this, this character was a real person. Nobody, uh, very few people know about it. But, uh, except Tone. Uh, but he, uh, I was assigned my first design, according to the script, saying, come up with a convenience store owner, preferably from the Middle East or India or whatever. And uh, this was just before lunchtime. I, I couldn't think of anything because it was my first assignment. So I went to the 7-Eleven store in North Hollywood. And there was this guy behind the counter. He had jet black hair, like a pompadour almost. He had an open black shirt with his hairy chest showing, and, and a big medallion, but I didn't put the medallion in there. Uh, and he had these, this, green, this green pair of polyester stretch pants, and he had a little mustache. And he was Indian, from India. And I was getting my lunch, and I was kind of looking at him. This is what the doctor ordered. So I, I said to myself, uh, I think I better, you know, memorize this person's feature. So I got my lunch, I went back to the studio. I started, I remembered, I tried to remember what he looked like. And I put it on paper. This was my first shot at it. And then I went to Matt Graney's office and I showed it to him. And he went, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a poo. Don't change anything. So I hit a poo right on the head the first time. And uh, up to this day, this gentleman doesn't know that I used him as one of the characters on the show. So how he looks like? He looks like a fool. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I went back. Well, this was 1989. And I, I went back for the, uh, to that same 7-Eleven, because they had a promotion turning all the 7-Elevens into Quickie Marts for the movie. And uh, I just wanted to see if he was still there. And I went back and I, uh, I saw that it was all new management. He was not there. Otherwise, I would have told him, uh, sir, I, uh, I didn't tell you this before, but I used you as a character. But well, you're lucky because he would have charged you royalties yeah. for his time. <laughs> That's the way it was my face. That's what I'm coming to. Had he found out, he would have put two and two together and say, well, okay, uh, where, where is my royalties? I want a piece of the action. Come on, uh, or I'll sue you. You know, he would, they would have said something like that. Uh, but he was not there. But that, uh, this is the story of a boo. I don't know what he's doing now, or if he's even still alive. But uh, he goes from place to place. Yes. <laughs> you know, guys, I am the, the basis of a boo. Oh, yeah. I do have a question. Because I've heard this story over and over again from you, and I never asked you which 7-Eleven it is, because I live in North Hollywood. It was the one that brought right. the Indian guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ventura Boulevard, they used to have a tennis court. Oh, on Ventura. Ventura and uh, Vineland. Vineland. Yeah, I know that. That's, that's the one. That's the one. one. Okay, right on. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> if it's still there. Oh, not. it is. It most certainly is. <laughs> Well, 
I was raised in Mexico and I came to the States. And my idea was to go to the smaller magazines because that's how you start. The smaller, then you grow to the bigger magazines. So every place I went, they look at my cartoons and say, you think they're crazy, you should go to Mad. But I was a fan of Mad. I knew Mad. Mad was a satirical magazine. They made fun of movies, comics, but not gas the way I did it. So I went there knowing that I was going to be rejected. But I wanted to meet some of the cartoonists over there. And uh, <laughs> I, I said, well, they, everybody says these are crazy. You have to go to Matt. So I went to Matt. And I got so nervous. I didn't know what to say. So I asked for Antonio Proías, which is the guy who does Spanish Spy. He's from Cuba. My English was worse than it is now, 50 years ago. Pretty bad. So. He was a lovely gentleman. He called and called everybody his brother. My brother, my brother. There you are. And we started speaking, of course, Spanish. And in Spanish, I asked him after a little while, can you introduce me to some of the editors here? Because uh, he said, well, you have to introduce yourself because I don't speak English either. You know? so, <laughs> so I I was introduced, and they liked my material. I worked. From, I started there. Brought them some ideas, they liked them, brought more, they liked them even more. And I have been working with Matt since 1962, and I just missed one issue since then. It's over half a century of working. And that was not my fault, it was a post office. <laughs> but it's been fantastic, you know. You know, Matt is a, it's an icon a magazine. I've just been part of it because made a very popular career for me in many ways. And uh, I am. Now you think the legacy of both, say, Matt and the Simpsons, a lot of social commentary, but it's not better disguised to be concerned in Um It's the way you want to see it. Uh, humor has always been a, a way to talk about problems, very serious problems, without making you cry, it makes you laugh. So you ameliorize the problem a little by making somebody laugh about something. With, uh, so Matt has created a plethora of writers, television writers, comedy writers, cartoonists, that they are like students of Matt. They have learned from Matt, they have grown with Matt, and they are now doing it. And what they do is they take something very serious and see the lighter side of it, like paper, blue, blue, or any of the other cartoons. So it's a, uh, with times, you face the problems of political correctness. Because the more you make fun of things, a lot of people start complaining about it. You cannot make fun of this. You cannot make fun of killing seals with a cane. Why not? No, no, no. It's, it, it is very serious problems, and the more the serious the problem, uh, a lot of people start defending the causes. So it stops the making fun of something by being politically correct. And Matt continues doing what they do best, which is making fun of things. And I'm very glad because they never had any censor. They do. They always say, "Do what you do," and uh, we do. And uh, they are very free and open. We get a lot of complaints, but <laughs> it's fine. I mean, I always remember as a kid, you know, you had to fold over in the back. Al Jaffe, yeah, a great cartoon. Been doing the folding since uh, the back pages. You take a drawing that you don't know what it is, and uh, you, you fold it, and now it's something else. Very clever. He's been doing that for many, many years. The gentleman is 95 years old and still working at Matt. Goes there, he lives in New York, walks to the office, says hello to the people. Just uh, amazing, amazing man. Still there. And uh, the Simpsons, 
Matt has been always a cartoonist, doing the underground cartoons. He had a great series. Fortunately, when they went to a television station, they asked him to come with a new family type of character on the, what was the name of the show? That they were, Tracy the Tracy Oldman show. He thought of the Simpsons right there on the waiting room. He sat there and created the characters right in the waiting room before he entered the office. And gave them the names of this family. Cousins, brothers, sisters, and everything. So when he entered there, presented something that he has created right on the spot with the names of the but, and they love it. They bought it. Wasn't the original name the Simpletons? <laughs> don't remember. Simpletons? Simpletons? Could have been. I don't remember. I mean, I, remember, I hear so many stories, and I'm always looking for answers. That, that's what happened. Uh, I don't recall that one, but what I remember is that Miss Holman, they asked her to do the voice of one of the characters, and she refused. <laughs> so to this day, she's going, ah! <laughs> I should have taken that job, but uh, she didn't, and uh, she lost probably a hundred million dollars <laughs> on voice making alone. But uh, it's, it's, I am a fan of that Simpsons, besides being a cartoonist. I have every piece of merchandise that they have ever done. I have it. I have a whole storage house just for Simpsons. <laughs> And uh, the thing is, I thought, I don't want to have it in my studio. Well, they don't fit there, there's too many, too many things. So I have a whole collection because I love them. And what I love is that these characters that these gentlemen draw all the time have grown from a very family to a complete city. Every element that is necessary for a story has been created. They look exactly as they should. They belong there. A chief of police, a guy who has a store, a gangster, name it, and they have it. A jazz player. And it's because it's a group of writers that they are so clever and so concentrated on what they do that they have made a perfect city. And the amazing part is that all those characters are despicable. <laughs> If you analyze any of the Simpsons character, including the, the preacher, all of them are nasty and mean and selfish. There's not a really quality in any of the characters. But they are amazing, loving group. At the end, everybody loves each other. There's a family feeling. And that's what's great about them. Even the worst of them yeah, that's my view. <laughs> it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And this gentleman, when he mentions about that you have to find some rules to follow, to, the reason they have to do that is because in animation, there's hundreds of people working on the project. So all of them have to match. One day is, is doing a wife, and the guy is doing the husband. So. It, and then another guy is doing the same husband for another scene. So all of them have to match. So when you see the show, all the characters are matching. They are in the per perfect. They look alike. So they get the, these rules. Very complex. Like the distance from one eye to another has to be another eye. Bart has to have seven points, not eight, not six. So everything is absolutely measured. Why? Because it's a lot of people have to do it. Yeah. Why? It's nine points. Nine points. <coughs> I respect the director. I think Jeff got down our throats. He, he corrected me a few minutes ago, and I was just like, hey, if he's going to correct me, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you did it wrong, you did eight, you did to do nine. Oh, okay, you're just. I, I balance between eight and nine. I always do. I can't help it. I don't know why I do it. So, the reason I have drawn some of the Simpsons is because 
editorially, some of the people figure it out that people who watch the show have the show. But when you're doing the comic book, it has to be a little more freedom, this movement that we, you cannot capture in a paper what these gentlemen are doing on the screen. In the screen there's animation. So the guy can go like that, and there's 16 drawings from here to here. So when they're doing it like that, you, you are seeing it on the screen in movement. When you're doing paper, you better exaggerate the movement because it's going to be a very still drawing. So they decide to, to give artists like me and other guys the chance to draw the Simpsons on their style to give them a little more movement. So they asked me if I could draw the Simpsons and said, well, I cannot follow these rules. I said, no, 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 draw it on your own style. Which was even worse because I tried it to look like the Simpsons, but that's what they wanted. Eventually, they changed back to the to draw on the style. How do you call it? Form? Where you have to draw the style? On style. On style. No, no, no. Character. On style. Form. On model. On model. <laughs> you have to draw on model. Again. So now, we've been. The reason they do that is because they wanted Tom to work for them again. <laughs> so, I, you know, and like you say, I, I, I'm a fan. I'm just as big a fan as, as you are. It's like I, I just wanted to do it because I just love them so much, and uh, I, I didn't. My, my plan wasn't to do it on model so I can do it like ten years later. My, I just wanted to do it because I figured if I was going to do it once, I might as well do it right. And that's the thing about the Simpsons characters in the world, you know, all of the characters have to have that upper lip, the overbite. Mm. Um, all their eyes need to be low to see, you know, spheres. Some of them have smaller ones, but they, they all have to have it. And like you said, the, the distance between the eyes from character to character will change, but on the same character they need to stay very consistent. Uh, what are the other things that are... Uh, I'm doing it right things? now. Okay, cool. As far as the eyes are concerned, Here's another piece of paper. No, this is additional work. <laughs> uh, never, ever draw the eye, the uh, what do you call them? Uh, pupils? Pupils like this, cross-eyed. Why? Ne because they're, they, for some reason, mentioned that it's off-model. It's not in character if they're cross-eyed. And they said, this is fine. And of course, huh. This is fine. Going the opposite direction. Wall eyed, they call it. Yeah, they're looking this way. But never. Never cross eyed. No. Ah. This is from David Silver. That's a very talented gentleman who has been directing many of the shows. He, he's and the. Uh, artist too. He brought the show to life. Yeah. He directed the movie also. And the movie. And he plays the saxophone on the two parts. Yeah, he was still the party. With a fire on.